I'm Christian Schiller. Welcome to my podcast, an enthusiastic ramble through whatever has taken my interest the past week or so. Expect technology, games, history, travel, geekery, and as always, much, much more. Welcome to another Chinchilla Squeaks. I hope you enjoyed the Ukraine special. Unfortunately, things have changed quite a bit in the weeks after that, which is a great shame. But uh, yeah, we'll see what happens there. A little bit back to a more normal episode. Today, I have some links to share with you and then an interview with Kin Lane from Postman, who makes a comeback He heads the developer relations program over at Postman and they had quite a few updates in version 10. So I'll talk about those with him. But first, let's get stuck in. Well, I was very excited. Mac OS Ventura was released this week, not last week, this week, actually just yesterday, no, day before yesterday. And uh, also iOS, iPad OS 16 as well. Bought a whole bunch of new changes. Some of the ones that excited me were updates to mail with things like scheduling and uh, scheduling for follow-up emails. Not quite as seamless as I would have liked. The emails still sit there. I know when I tried Spark, um, the emails would actually get hidden temporarily. That's kind of what I was hoping, sort of out of sight, out of mind until that date. But that's not how they work. You could probably set up a smart mailbox or something like that. Um, photos library sharing, also not quite what I was hoping for. <laughs> Turns out you need a lot of iCloud storage, which I suppose makes sense, but uh, makes it a little hard to implement, especially if you have a large library, which is kind of why I wanted it, was to be able to share just some pictures with my wife, but there you go. And uh, also some more under the hood, which I'm looking forward to trying, actually, just after this one to the video codex, which will improve my streaming performance, and one to the virtualization framework, which will also improve, uh, well, not improve, but contribute to the virtualization emulation options available by default on macOS. Again, I am putting together a video that will cover a lot of this and take advantage of that. So all those things excited me. A lot of those were in iPadOS as well. I haven't been game to try stage manager yet. I don't really have any need for it, but so far so good. The settings overhaul doesn't bother me so much. And there are many, many posts you can go and find on Ventura and its feature list, but I'm going to highlight, as I often do, an article from the Eclectic Light Company, Ventura for Early Adopters. Um, This is post-beta and what you might expect and some problems with it, some interesting problems with it. I always love how uh, Eclectic Light Company really digs into these things and how they even know to do it in the first place, uh, including ways to install software updates manually which is kind of cool from the command line. Uh, But also some interesting things it does with regards to security. It actually kind of downgrades security after an upgrade, removing certain features, downgrading certain versions of uh, the security checking and virus checking that macOS has been doing a lot of recently, which is odd. Uh, He also mentions changes or problems, not changes, problems with stage manager and some memory leak issues, but um, I've not noticed. So some interesting things there. I will try Stage Manager eventually. <laughs> I think uh, it may, may work for me, but I'm kind of happy with the way I have my things set up. Anyway, um, I haven't noticed any incompatibility issues yet. I've noticed a little bit of slowdown with Intel application, which is interesting, but that could also be completely unrelated. Who knows? Uh, I've mostly noticed it with WhatsApp, uh, which is still an Intel application on the desktop version, and they had some other issues this week, so maybe it's related to that. Who knows? On the subject of Apple and their product announcement, something that a lot of people noticed in their (laughs) press release announcement of the new iPads was a screenshot of DaVinci Resolve, which is a video editing software, uh, mostly desktop only, But there was a screenshot on the iPad and it was kind of one of those little teases that then people got confirmed. And I'm uh, I'm focusing on a mention in DP review, digital and photography review here. And it is confirmed that DaVinci Resolve will be coming 
to iPad. No full details yet, but it will be happening. And I find this interesting because it's the probably the first professional video editor application coming to iPad, and it's not Final Cut, <laughs> which is strange. But it's DaVinci, which has actually been taking a lot of market share away from other video editing tools, primarily because one of the uh, versions of it you can use is free, completely free. So it's quite um, it's quite uh, compelling to use, to be honest with you, and it's fairly well respected in the industry. So yeah, strange that I found that kind of an odd phenomenon, but um, interesting to to see where that goes and, and what it's like and, and what kind of hardware you need and how it will work on the small screen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We shall see. Again, in a letter beginning company names and updates. Another article from DP Review, Adobe Max 2020, major updates to Lightroom and Photoshop, plus more on Adobe's AI future. I have been a Creative Cloud subscriber for some time, and actually I have a lot of time now for Adobe. They have really been improving the tools quite a lot recently. I wish I could get Lightroom into my workflow better. I, I tend to find it still doesn't quite work for my workflow yet, but Every now and then I kind of download it, install it, mess around with it, and then delete it again. <laughs> One day maybe I'll stick because they're actually adding a lot new, more editing features into it itself. So you don't have to go to Photoshop. I think that's the main, most of the photos I take are just photos. I don't really edit them or anything. Maybe when I start doing more uh, professional photography or using photos for professional uses in the future, that will become more of a concern for me again especially since I actually do have access to a mirrorless camera, but I use it exclusively for video work, but uh, it could. Um, and then Photoshop also on all platforms, they improved the object selection tool. This leans a lot into the AI uh, power that uh, Adobe is adding. I have noticed that the, I remember the days of lots of manual fiddling around with marquee and kind of magic wand to select objects. And now some of the default selection objects um, are very, very clever, actually saved a lot of time from how it used to be. And there's a screenshot here from the demo they showed of a woman with kind of very frizzy hair, which would be something that would traditionally be quite hard to select. It's still got the background obviously showing through some of her hair, but still uh, it, it's actually quite smart at what it's picked up. Um, and even like uh, removing small it's kind of getting into Google level, Google level AI, like removing items um, and then fills in the background with the content. So the example is showing deleting a compass from a tree branch, for example, uh, similar with restoring photos. And then the other mention things they mention are Adobe's experiments with artificial intelligence and and using it, which is also pretty fascinating. Uh, I'm actually going to be working on a new creative AI show with someone very soon. So it'd be cool to see what they can do with that. But they have this generative AI feature in um, coming, I think. And they have this content authenticity initiative. This is one of those many things that is relating to uh, how... Creative Studios and libraries and the like will handle this forthcoming proliferation of um, AI-generated media, shall we say. So, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. We will see what happens there. One more sort of announcement-related news item, and this was a strange one that I think some people didn't entirely understand the strategy, but whatever, it was okay. Pocket Cast, a cross-platform podcasting application, which I actually personally use, and I paid for it, and then they removed all their paid tiers, but okay, fine, has open-sourced all of its mobile apps. I think its desktop app is basically the... It's basically an electron... I think the desktop apps are basically... Electron applications wrapping the web version anyway. So not completely open source, but kind of figure the code out relatively easily. Um, doesn't really explain why, but mostly I think because they're leveraging the fact they are now owned by Automatic, the company behind WordPress. And I guess there's less requirement for them to make money from subscriptions and app sales. So why not go open source? Because open source is kind of in the blood of automatic. Uh, I will 
have a dig around some of these at some point in the future and be intrigued to see how to get them to run. Maybe that will be a future um, hands-on or learning live stream. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think they're basically web apps with wrappers, but to see how they constructed it, how they handle a lot of the uh, the audio streaming, etc. But it's interesting. Interesting announcement, and we'll see where that takes the company and where the apps end up after that. Next, something from the New York Times, uh, written by Kashmir Hill. Quite a long article and based on a long experience of hers, living in the, well, not living, but spending time in the metaverse. I actually acquired an Oculus recently, and I uh, I don't know, I, I just, I, I can't get into VR. I found it weird. It makes me feel kind of unwell, and I ended up uh, trading <laughs> the headset with um, with a friend um, I quite, I got it for free anyway. I won't explain, but, uh, I wasn't really interested in it and everything I've seen so far has kind of, I don't know, not been that appealing, but she goes in, in great detail in her experiences of jumping in at various different times, uh, and the sort of feedback and experience she gets. And I think some of it was interesting because much like with Facebook itself, children are not supposed to be able to, <laughs> to be in, the metaverse, but they are. And she met a lot of children there. She, and I think it was kind of an interesting, not that this is surprising, but reflection of the, <laughs> the general world. Um, some people were creepy. Some people were annoying. Most people were fine. Uh, she found the experience that you kind of move around and then you hear conversations, but you have to move towards them was initially disconcerting, but then kind of works in this environment, which the one time I tried this kind of experience, I had that same feeling. It was very odd. Um, you know, you have to sort of be social within the technology to get close to the conversation, which is sort of, uh, yeah, it was kind of odd. <laughs> and um, she talks about how there's still not really so many people using it, um, which makes it still feel a little empty. And that there's a lot of sort of community managers who um, don't have a massive amount to do yet. Uh, and she talks about how there's different sorts of people in the metaverse as well. There's people being entrepreneurs and running all sorts of business ideas, including uh, someone running comedy shows, uh, people just taking a break without going anywhere, this kind of thing. Yeah. It's it's very, it's, it actually found it, it didn't really encourage me to want to, to sign up and join it anymore, but still it was uh, an interesting read. <laughs> and maybe it will encourage, discourage, not change your opinion at all as well. Another, this is going <laughs> slightly different angle from MIT Technology Review, where the sci-fi dream of uh, cryonics never died. And this is interesting because one of the earliest companies working on this space, which is called Hello Tomorrow, is actually not no more than about five minutes walk from my office and my studio. Um, they have these custom ambulances you can actually see on the street here where they'll go and uh, pick up bodies to, to freeze. Um, and the article talks about how they're, they're still quite emerging and it's becoming bizarrely more affordable uh, despite the fact that scientifically speaking – there's still next to no evidence it has any kind of benefit or effect. <laughs> so the fact that a lot of people will spend a lot of money and a lot of faith on having their bodies preserved when actually there's no real evidence it will work at all. And there was one uh, one quote I loved, a couple here. It's a hopeless aspiration that reveals an appalling ignorance of biology, says Clive Cohen, a neuroscientist and professor at King's College London. I can't find the quote in here, but basically about saying that uh, you'll just be a thawed out corpse, <laughs> which you'll be a warm corpse. That's kind of what they're saying. I mean, again, I suppose the hope is always that um, you'll be revived into a time when this isn't true, that technology has significantly advanced, that this won't be a case anymore. But a lot of modern scientists think that that will never happen. But then... You know, we thought a lot of things about science will never happen in the past, and they have. So who knows? 
One other from MIT Technology Review leading into my final story. This is from Shannon Valor. We used to get excited about technology. What happened? And there's a wonderful photo of the beautiful, colorful old IMAX here. And how, yeah, I think I even find this myself now that we used to get a lot of, I don't know, uh, I think we've become kind of jaded and resistant to buying into tech promises of new technology now and how it's getting harder and harder for companies to pitch at us and and get us enthused. And the article is based kind of on a um, Twitter thread from the journalist. And I, I sort of wonder if a lot of it is just because I think she's of a similar age to me and that when we used to get excited about technology, it was because it was less, it was more of a thing. It was less common. It was more niche. Uh, and now technology is everywhere. It's so much more omnipresent and so much more invisible that it's hard to be excited about it. It's hard to get excited about an upgrade to a cloud service you don't even see as opposed to a new computer. And, you know, the, the jumps these days becoming less and less. Um, and what we need to do with technology is less and less needs these big jumps, I think. I don't know. It's a, it's an interesting one. But I, I do feel that. And, and again, it could just be because we're both um, older and maybe we just are less enthusiastic. <laughs> no offense to Shannon, but I, I kind of feel the same. And I think we're probably of a similar age and a similar vintage and a similar cultural upbringing. So that could be why why we're both not enthusiastic anymore. It would be interesting to hear from you. Are you still enthusiastic about technology? And if so, what and why? Very related to that, something from the Washington Post by uh, Natasha Tiku and Gerrit Devink about the billion-dollar tech unicorn is becoming rare again. And this is amazing because probably less than six months ago, they were everywhere. I was working for one. I got offered a job from another one. Every announcement was talking about billion-dollar unicorns, almost to the point that it was becoming irrelevant. <laughs> And now, six months later, with a crash and with economic times struggling, that has everything has kind of downgraded. And the specific example is talking about a Be Real, um, kind of one of the hottest applications at the moment, and how its valuation has been under a billion. And in some respects, I don't know if it's a bad thing. Maybe it's more of a stabilization of a, of a scene that was getting kind of ridiculous in the first place. And the fact that now valuations are kind of back to being slightly more realistic again is okay. But who knows? It, I, I suppose it depends. And, and it could be that the companies that are getting valued now and getting um, – more realistic valuations will be financially more stable and more sustainable in the future. Again, and I feel like I say this so much, we will see because who knows? Uh, but it was, it seems, I think I found it fascinating how just in such a short space of time, this change had happened. That was what fascinated me the most. And enough of all that. Um, now is my interview with Kin Lane, where we talk about updates to Postman 10 and new announcements from them. Enjoy. On this Chinchilla Squeaks, I'm joined yet again. It feels like multiple times, but I think it's only the second time by Kin Lane. Uh, do you still have the same job title over at Postman or has it changed since we last spoke? No, it's Chief Evangelist. I, I keep keep that going. Not quite sure what it means, but we're working on that. Do you still ever use the uh, old API Evangelist uh, monkey, or is that still something that's consigned to the past now? No, I do, because it's what a lot of people know me as, and, and that's where Chief Evangelist was born. Um, Abhinav, our CEO, gave it to me when I started here. So, um, And I just redid my site and I'm going to do some writing on API evangelists. So no, it's uh, I can't put it to bed quite yet. <laughs> uh, very much another topic of wanting to redo a site. I think mine has been in a state of needing to be redone for about three years. And next week, next week. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, Postman. Postman is now at version 10. I will admit 
I haven't used it for a little while. I haven't really had a need, although I, I do know it's something a lot of people use. I was looking actually at the number earlier. 20 million developers use Postman. Very quickly, let's summarize for the other, I don't know, 40 million. I'm not sure how many developers there are who don't use Postman. What is it? Well, that's an interesting question because uh, it's evolved over the years. But it began as, a, as an API client, primarily for web APIs or HTTP APIs. And then over the last five, six years, has evolved into what we'd consider a full lifecycle solution. So you can design APIs, you can test APIs, you can document them. And so as we've uh, spread across the lifecycle and we're offering more capabilities, one of the great things we're hearing from folks is, hey, that, uh, I kind of need that for event-driven WebSocket APIs. Hey, I kind of need that for GraphQL. I also need that for gRPC. And so that's what we've really been striving for is to be a, a not just a client, but a lifecycle tool across these different types of APIs. But to elevate it one more level, you know, for folks who are listening that may not be technical, because you, you said there's another 40 de- million developers. I think we're we're actually from, seeing more. Not- <laughs> yeah. I feel like uh, 60 million no, there's is like, somewhere. But yeah. You were correct. I think 50 to 60 million is where we're at with developers. But we're actually seeing more business stakeholders, mm. product managers, yep. and uh, engineering managers, and architects, and others get involved. And what Postman is to them is Postman helps you see APIs. And so as a client, you know, I want to be able to see the requests and the responses and individual API. But when you're when you're higher up on the enterprise food chain, you need to be able to see your API operations, mm. see your teams, see across many APIs. Yeah. And that's what Postman is. It's actually an interesting point you say that. I feel like last time we spoke, a few things have changed. There's some technical ones we'll get into in a minute, but I feel like at least in the definitely in the past year, um, I can mention API to more people and they will know sort of what I'm referring to from a conceptual and and most definitely a business perspective and the importance of them. Um, Do you think there's any particular reason for that or just that it's, it's saturated into business now enough that there's a, there's more of an understanding? No, it's purely because I've been evangelizing it for 10 years. It's all me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, it is it is because uh, it is because it's it's part of it's the core of every digital transformation. And, and every enterprise is kind of on that digital transformation journey. And APIs are how you do that. So as you get further along in that journey, you're going to become more API literate, more API aware. Mm. And you're going to start needing to see them more. Uh, and that's why Postman's doing so well. And of course, I think now we can dig into the technical underpinnings of what an API can mean. I think back in the past, I don't know about 10 years ago, I'm not sure, but I think we both probably remember that there was a time when API meant something before HTTP REST APIs. I can't even, re- is it like soap and things? I can't even remember the technologies anymore, to be yes, honest with you. You're <laughs> correct. You're correct. <laughs> yeah. And then HTTP APIs, REST APIs kind of became the dominant protocol for some, well, not even a protocol, uh, pattern, paradigm, uh, whatever you want to call it, for some time and still are. Um, and I do believe last time we spoke, you had just added support for GraphQL. Um, which I'm almost has almost become kind of not yesterday's news, but it's not the cool kid in town anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like since then you've added WebSockets and Socket IO. Um, those are two technologies that are vaguely familiar to me. What are what are they in their relation to API world? Yeah, so so REST or Web APIs are very much your bread and butter, kind of your digital resources. I have images, I have files, I have SMS, uh, I have payments. Those are the resources. But as you have more of these resources, you needed to start stitching them together because it got pretty complex. And that's kind of where GraphQL comes in. It's a graph, it's connecting, it's it's acknowledging the relationships between these data, this data. Now, as those the volume of data grows, uh, 
making API requests, waiting for responses gets to be pretty cumbersome for a lot of applications and kind of the experiences we we uh, we need online, you know, real time chat, real time video, uh, gaming, things like that. So you need a uh, web socket or Kafka or mm, yeah. Nats. There's several of these real time kind of patterns and protocols that are used and they generally use TCP um, because HTTP kind of has some shortcomings there. And so uh, web sockets and, and sockets IO. You'll you'll see mo- you know a lot of stock market APIs using uh, web sockets. You'll see a lot of Bitcoin using web sockets. Things that have a a rapid fire kind of need, uh, and so they're becoming much more popular because of that. And um, so, as far as like, I I I know web socket, but what is socket IO? I, that's one that isn't so familiar to me. What's the difference between yeah, the it's, two? It's just a layer, a layer on top of it because uh, TCP and and web sockets are very. I wouldn't say they're wild west. They're protocols. They're they're well known, but you can do a lot of different things within them. There's not a lot of structure, or scaffolding, or standards to how you like. That's the confusion between web APIs and like REST. REST is an architectural Mm. pattern that lays on top of HTTP and gives you a set of rules to kind of play with how much you follow those rules. That's up for a lot of debate. But web sockets or TCP is is void of a lot of those rules. And sockets IO kind of came in and got opinionated about some of that and and was pretty successful in in. as the underbelly for a lot of different app experiences and making it easier for developers to, to use these API. Okay. And then we come to what you're just announcing, which is GRPC and GRPC. I don't think is particularly new from, from what I've heard, but it, it seems to have become quite popular recently or more popular recently. What, what is GRPC and how does it, where does it fit in this world of the kind of send requests, constant connection, et cetera, et cetera, different ways of communicating across applications? Yeah, so think of uh, gRPC APIs as kind of your industrial grade pipes for your enterprise. You're you're probably not going to do a public API with with gRPC. You may you may do a partner API, but gRPC is is very much those industrial grade pipes. So performance speed, quality, um, and it are, are real needs with that. And it's built by Google and yep. it's been around. I've heard stories of since the beginning of the century, just to make it sound like it's been a long time. So I think it's Google um, RPC, but, isn't it? I think. Yeah. 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 It's, it's remote <laughs> procedure call. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's very much about running code remotely. That's what RPC is. And so it's, uh, it's not for everybody. There's a learning curve with it. You have to be pretty technical to understand it. Um, but it, you get a lot of really solid Java, Go libraries that you can easily use. So it's a it's a favorite of of some folks and feel like it's it's the way API should be done. But uh, again, it's, you don't want to do public APIs with it. You want to really keep it keep it your internal backbone of mm. what's happening. So I'm, I'm assuming it probably has quite a lot of uh, high usage and application to microservices and things like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, that require more yeah. than just JSON payloads. Yeah, protocol buffers is is a much more structured, um, efficient. Um, it's much. It's the serialization of it is much more efficient and performant than than JSON payloads. And um, but it's it's a little less forgiving. You you can't be as sloppy as you can with with JSON. So uh, you have to be pretty precise, and that's really where where Postman comes in because we started just being a, a client, an API client, so you can make calls with with gRPC, and we did that in beta. But what you were just talking about recently is is us kind of layering in what Postman's really known for is that that testing, that automation. Uh, and working with a gRPC API to test it, to have little scripts that you can run mm. against it to automate and and do a lot of the things uh, developers have been doing for years with with web APIs, but bring that to the gRPC realm. So just to dig into that a little bit more, I've got the the desktop application open, um, 
it, it, it's still fairly familiar and similar to if you've ever used it before. So with all these different, um, uh, I, I still don't know the best way to call these um, options. <laughs> Let's call them options for now. Uh, for 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 managing the life cycle of my APIs, is the experience across using each of them the same? Um, at least not necessarily in terms of layout and things like that, but in terms of the, the experience, can I still do what you said, the mocking, the testing, the, the auto-generated documentation, all those sorts of things that Postman has been known for? Is that possible across all of them where relevant? Yes, um, but with some caveats, with some asterisks, because is there's some nuances and differences. I mean, with, with WebSockets and gRPC, you have a sustained connection, so you have a lot more throughput than you would just a, a request and response. And so how your the collection, that integration, testing, the automation works in that environment is, is going to be have a, a little bit more of a nuance. But collections, this has been one of the challenging parts is, is collections as a as a executable represent, representation of an API call, a request and response, that's pretty clear. You have authentication, you have a request, and you have a response. But with gRPC, you have uh, potentially multiple calls happening simultaneously. You have to, what's, how do you write the scripts against that to automate and test that? How do you apply variables? And, and so it gets, gets pretty complicated pretty fast so replicating that in the ui there's definitely some nuances that 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 are different when you're working in each of those paradigms and can all of all of these options be packaged into this i think one of postman's kind of uh secret source elements this collection can no matter what you're building in you can they can all be packaged into one collection i guess yeah yeah, I mean, that's a, um, you know, and the the other nuance of this is, is if I'm working with a, a, a REST API, am I, I'm a, uh, am I producing the API or am I just consuming mm, the true. API? And so uh, in a collection could represent an API you're deploying. I can mock it. I can, I can deploy this API. And then you can also just be a consumer. I'm, I'm making requests of this. Maybe I have a mock that I use as part of that testing or automation. But that's that starts shifting when you get into uh, real time and event driven, and, and you have brokers, you have uh, you have publishers and subscribers, but you have brokers as well. And so, uh, how a collection, you know, uh, think of a. A, a web API you represent with Swagger, Open API, and Open API definition. That's widely considered to be the contract for an API. What is possible? A collection is a representation of that that contract or that source of truth for any moment in time. For example, I have the Twitter API, uh, and then I can have a collection that represents uh, just a handful of COVID searches against the Twitter API. So it's like one business use case of the Twitter API represented as the collection where the contract could represent many business use cases. So how do you do that in a, um, how do you, a, a collection represents a, a business transaction or a business value or a series of business value and how you represent that in, in gRPC when you have real time, um, high volume, high throughput, um, it, it, it was a challenge to get collections to, uh, to, to work in that environment. Well, I look forward to experimenting. I'm going to one more question on the gRPC thing. And I have a couple of other things I want to ask you about. Um, I couldn't resist because it's mentioned in the kind of the, the marketing blog post, uh, started out with a single feature request, but it was in 2018. So what happened? <laughs> was it just took a while to get to the top of the list, I guess? Yeah, I mean, well, it took a while to be prioritized. But then once you start, see, Postman's is such a Swiss army knife. Mm. There are so many different ways that people use it. Um, and so when, once you encounter that and you try to 
it seems straightforward to go, well, we can just expose gRPC and, and then we'll build a mock doc test, all the same things. And no, it's actually much more complicated than you would think about how, uh, how, how these different uh, remote procedure calls can be made. And then with WebSockets publishing and subscribing um, and how brokers work. We started with, with uh, WebSockets because it was kind of the lowest hanging fruit, the highest opportunity. So we responded to that. We learned, we learned, we iterated. But once we hit the collections, because uh, uh, collections as a representation of that request response is easy, but it wasn't built for real time. And so getting collections to work well in a real time environment, an always on connection took some work. And then we hit the life cycle. So how do you dock mock test? Um, how do you do those things that are familiar and bread and butter for, for Postman users? So all of those kind of things, it, it took a while. And uh, but once once, you know, that's why we got web sockets, sockets, IO, gRPC. Uh, we're adding others um, much more rapidly because we yeah. kind of laid that foundation. Yeah. Well. And that's definitely true. Like all three of those have happened in the past year and a bit, I think, as far as I can see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you mention what's going to be next? Is there anything next? Is there anything left? I don't know. <laughs> to add, I'm not sure. Yeah, there's, um, I mean, I can't say specifically, but definitely uh, investment in Kafka, um, more in that realm. Um, and then, you know, the IoT device realm, MQTT yeah. and other oh, yeah, more device-based, we've get, we got a pretty loud demand there. But, uh, you know, really the, you know, people should head over to the our GitHub app support repo because that's where they pay attention to. They don't even pay attention to me. I mean, they pay attention to me, but I don't carry as much weight as people who vote up and, and yeah. ask for things on our, on our GitHub repo. So that's yeah. going to ultimately what decides it and it could change. So on this kind of... Uh, Open philosophy. Um, obviously, the the core of Postman isn't open, but you have mentioned some places where it is. I also came across uh, this this announcement from you last April about the Open Technologies Program. Um, yes. What is that? Because there, there are obviously some other open standards bodies in the API world. So what what is the Postman one? Yeah, so um, that is my secondary title. I'm chief evangelist and director of the Open Technologies Program. Um, and so what is the Open Technologies Program? I mean, it first starts with open public APIs, knowledge about it, our developer relations. I run our developer relations team. The second group is uh, our lifecycle and governance, which is open knowledge. Like how do you do APIs consistently, whether you use Postman or not? How do you how do you follow a consistent, well-known life cycle? Um, and then governance, um, which is is right now being really defined with spectral, which yeah. is an open source yeah. standard created yeah. actually by our competitor, Stoplight. Yep. Yep. Yep, for sure. um, but we work with them and we adopt we we use spectral in the, in the platform now. But then beyond that is uh, specifications. The next group is the specifications and tooling. So Swagger Open API, Async API, JSON Schema, GraphQL, gRPC, all those protocols and, and patterns that we just talked about. Um, I have a number of people on those working groups um, on my team and Async API we're heavily investing in. Uh, Open API, uh, Gra JSON Schema is all about validation and modeling. And then uh, the fourth group is data and intelligence. So open data um, and machine learning, open uh, machine learning models. How do you make sense of things? So all of that for me and for, for the Postman platform is uh, it's the lifeblood. And uh, we do have open tools like Newman. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of open specifications and tooling that we build converters, stuff like that. But really, the open technologies is about heavily doubling down, quadrupling down on our investment in these open specifications. And we're, we're expanding that to open industry standards yeah. like uh, PSD2, yeah. Fire for healthcare, yeah. IATA for airlines. Yeah. And so that whole spectrum, that's, that's the open tech world. Yeah, it was actually interesting to see that one. I have covered, I covered FHIR with someone else on here a while ago. Um, PSD2 is one people probably hear all the time if you've ever been involved with a fintech, but I actually had 
absolutely no idea what it stood for. So now I can see, <laughs> which is kind of cool. Payment, payment services directive, yeah. I believe. Is Two. <laughs> this is, yes. I don't want well, one now three. Like, three three oh, just well. came out, so buckle up. And I guess do some of these uh, activities feed into the, uh, is it, what's it called? Do you call it the marketplace? The um, Network. The network, the API network. Does, does a lot of these underpinnings uh, feed into that? Yeah, so when you work with any of these APIs, producing or consuming, you do that in a workspace. And workspaces can be made available by a private partner. That, that was V10 release also, or our public network. And so you would publish all your microservices and everything to your internal your partner APIs to your partner networks. And then uh, your the public network, you can go there and you can find like Salesforce and Twilio and Twitter and Stripe, and Slack, all of them maintain their, their public APIs as collections in workspaces. And you can like the, I forget how the Salesforce was up to like 80, 90,000 forks. So you can engage with your, the 20 million Postman developers there um, via our network, but you can also have your partner and private networks just for your team and, and company as well. I think I meant more in terms of the, uh, the, um, the open technologies program. Uh, do do oh, any of the um, activities in that influence uh, the my network or is it oh, yeah. just out of, sheer will of no, being forced to do best practice. No, my, my team's OKRs are all centered around, is it repeatable and hands-on in a workspace? So if you're DevRel and you do a workshop, you put it, you use the workspaces under and you put it in the public network and you, you conduct your workshop there. Um, and then uh, when it comes to open API, uh, you demonstrate things in workspaces by publishing the open API there. Um, you can have like, uh, and then this coming together for an industry like IATA has a workspace that I'm working with them on. And so it has the the airline standards for flights and hotels and different things like that there. And you can validate APIs that they're IATA compliant using Postman collections and okay. S. And so that's another example. But then also uh, Open okay. Technologies is very much the roadmap. We're pushing, you know, Async API isn't in the product yet. But we've been investing in Async API for over a year now, and now it's it's being built into the product. And so we're the kind of out in the front line, finding the tools, finding the specs, the standards that are needed, validating them with customers and industries, and then we bring them in and, and bring them as part of the roadmap. So we've mentioned GRPC and you mentioned this uh, partners network. Is there anything else in Version 10 that's worth mentioning, or is it lots of uh, performance and yeah, enhancements? The, and- well, no, I would say so the the underlying Git, so we're really doubling down on mapping to existing Git workflows, Git ops, so you can have all the, all, everything that's in a workspace syncs with your Git, whether it's GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket. Um, and so that is more seamless, more natural, more like your, your existing software development lifecycle, but with the API lifecycle layered on. And then, uh, um, the other is governance. So yep. we, we, inve- we put spectral in and you can lint your open APIs and that helps teams deliver more consistent APIs, uh, by being able to, to lint them with spectral rules. So those are the, the two other big ones other than gRPC and partner workspaces. What does the API governance mean to you, apart from the, 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 the linting side of it? Um, and governance is a broad term and, and can mean many different things in the technology yeah. space. But from an API perspective, what does it mean? I can see you've written a blog post on this less than a week ago. <laughs> um, I write a lot of them. Yeah. So what's, what's the overarching yeah. themes of that? Well, the first, most people are going to think it is what I would consider design governance. So the the design consistency of your API across teams and keeping that as consistent as you possibly can using common standards and patterns. And that's what most people are going to think about when you when you think about API governance. But for me, it also depends on, hey, it's, is what's your test coverage? Uh, 100%, near 100% of your APIs have tests. And how many of those paths, parameters, what's the scope of those tests? Is that consistent? 
Um, is it do all your APIs have documentation and are those, is that documentation consistent? Meaning that do they have all examples and summaries and uh, everything that makes for rich docs. And so a lot of those other operational level considerations governing them across uh, teams, hundreds or thousands of APIs, that's, that's the full governance because that's about controlling the state of your enterprise, which is, is more towards governance. Uh, but nobody on the ground floor of enterprise organizations cares about governance. You have, it's, we call it enablement. It's the, the lack of consistency across your operations is due to a lack of enablement of your teams. And that's why you don't have governance with governance in place and in a strategy you uh, you're enabling your teams and they're more successful and, and delivering uh, more consistently at the velocity that you desire. So, yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So, I think last time I asked you this question, I actually think your answer might have been WebSockets and GRPC. So, so <laughs> from now, yes. what what do you think is the what is the future of APIs for the next one, two years? You've been looking at this for ten years, taking that deep step back. What do you think? What do you think's the new things to watch for? Um, I mean. Really, it's it's keeping pace with the change that's happening across enterprises. Like, there's so many APIs being delivered that we're heavily investing in mapping. Just like I said with Git, we're mapping to your existing software yeah. development yeah. lifecycle, uh, your existing CI/CD. When it comes to gateways, you know, Gartner kept telling us you got to launch a gateway to do business. You got to have a gateway. And we're like, no, we're going to work with all the gateways. And so, when it comes to uh, documenting and, and discovery and knowing where all your APIs are, we're just going to keep helping you map your existing landscape because uh, you're moving fast. Teams are moving fast. You want, you don't want to get in their way. And like I said, you want to enable them. So really m- doubling down on governance and this, this policy management that, uh, that spectral rules and, and others allow and letting teams just build, but then bringing order to that, that chaos and uh and helping uh teams just deliver consistent high quality apis that are reliable without having to think about they just move fast and they do it uh and and you can always validate well we have these this documentation and contracts for an api does it actually match what's in production and we'll do that for you automated in an automated way so design first will still be relevant but really uh uh, reverse engineering the state of the enterprise beast as it is the machine and, and going, Hey, yeah, this is, this is what the documentation represents. That's, that's where we're at. It's interesting because I kind of feel like that's something across the board. It, there's a, a repeated mention of that. Now there's a period of consolidation, maybe in some technology um, we could be looking at, I don't know if this is a term or not uh, API ops, API experience, um, actually yeah. making them work better and fit into workflows as opposed to creating more new, just actually making them work better for developers and, and everybody that relies on those developers, I suppose. Uh, it's not the most yeah. exciting and- answers to these questions, but it's probably the answer that a lot of people need. <laughs> well, it's- it's got to have more business alignment. That's yeah. what I'm seeing. Those yeah. workflows have to have business value. We can't just be doing tech, tech because tech's cool. It's got to have business value moving forward. <laughs> it's not the it's not the way that a lot of people would like to resolve a conversation. But I think that's a good resolution to a conversation. <laughs> this is so so um, people can obviously find Postman Ten at Postman dot com. I also noticed you are hosting your own show. Uh, breaking changes and I can see yeah. a few familiar faces and a few less familiar on there um, mostly around the topics of the API universe which I kind of like as a, as a term um, and I think you just released one actually so um, if people want to check that out as well that's also on the Postman website and um, yeah we look forward to I version appreciate that. 11, 12, 15, (laughs) and talking again in the future.
yeah, one, one major release every year. So stay tuned. That was my interview with Kin Lane. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I have published a few articles recently, obviously my Ukraine coverage and related to that, an article for Cybersecurity Month, also on some applications from Macpo, who are a Ukrainian tech company who I met at the event. And finally, an article on Serenity OS, all on Hacker Noon, where I'm currently doing uh, some work for and kind of writing almost exclusively for when relevant. So you can find those all on Hacker Noon. I will get those aggregated to my own website soon. Um, videos. I also published a Serenity OS video. I have a couple of other videos in progress. I have also changed my streaming schedule. I'm now streaming about four times a week on different subjects. Um, probably it's best to just look at my website on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Christian Chiller to find what they all are. I'm about to jump onto one in the next 20 minutes, actually. Uh, so quite a lot happening there. I'm just about to wrap up the final draft in my mind of my debut fiction novel as well. I will definitely be sending out more details about that for proofreaders and all sorts of things very soon. So that has been taking up quite a lot of my time. And I am weighing up tools to overhaul my website. My last learning live stream on, uh, sorry, yeah, I, I keep forgetting. I, some of the new streams I have, I haven't really named anything. But the last kind of technology-related live stream I did on Monday, I was looking at Astro, which I quite like the look of. And I might do a final comparison to Eleventy, and then figure out what I'm going to do and what I'm going to use. So it's quite a few things I'm working on there. I think that's it. So as always, you can find more about me at christianchiller.com and it's the website in its current form. And uh, I will talk to you all again soon. Thank you very much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the show. Find out more about me at christianchiller.com where you can find show notes, sign up for my newsletter and find all of my writing, games, work and video links. There's also details on how to get in touch with me. And if you want to get even closer to what I do, Join my Discord server for behind-the-scenes discussions and helping me produce my shows and work.